Hello and welcome. It's Tuesday the 18th of March. You're tuned in to our 10am newscast coming to you from Arirang's news centre in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. The United States and the European Union slam Russia's actions in Crimea by ex ex imposing sanctions on several key individuals. Russian President Vladimir Putin signs a decree recognizing Crimea as a sovereign state. A UN panel calls for international action to deal with human rights abuses in North Korea, which it says are on par with those committed by the Nazis. Plus, Korea's exports of auto parts set a record high of 26 billion US dollars last year. We'll tell you what's driving the growth in a special report. Our top story this morning, Russian President Vladimir Putin has recognized Crimea as a sovereign state, a precursor to its annexation, which the West and Ukraine says is illegal. Earlier, the United States and the European Union had imposed sanctions on several officials from Russia and Ukraine. This all follows Sunday's referendum, in which almost all Crimeans voted in favor of becoming a part of Russia. Connie Lee starts us off. Another step has been taken toward the full annexation of Crimea. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Monday recognized the Republic of Crimea as sovereign and independent. The executive order posted on the Kremlin's website came just hours after the European Union and the U.S. imposed sanctions and asset freezes against Russian and Ukrainian officials. We are imposing sanctions on specific individuals responsible for undermining the sovereignty, territorial integrity and government of Ukraine. The sanctions, which include travel bans, were in retaliation for Sunday's referendum vote in Crimea, which was deemed illegal by Western leaders. In the referendum, 97 percent of the voters approved of leaving Ukraine and joining Russia. The results brought joy to Russians, not only in Crimea, but also in Moscow. It's legal. I support Putin. I'm for reuniting Russian borders and the reunion of the Russian people. Up to 60 percent of the residents in Crimea are Russian, but ethnic Tartars, who make up more than 10 percent of Crimea's population, are concerned about inter-ethnic conflict. Of course we're afraid, but what can we do? Certainly not run away anywhere. No, we don't have that on our minds. I can't even think about it. The Crimean parliament has declared all Ukrainian state property on the peninsula as property of the Crimean Republic, and its lawmakers are in Moscow now to discuss the annexation by Russia. Connie Lee, Adida News. A UN panel that has been probing North Korea's human rights violations over the past year presented its final report to the Human Rights Council in Geneva on Monday. Facing strong opposition from the North and its ally China, the Commission of Inquiry wants to make a case at the International Criminal Court. Chae Sun reports. A special UN commission on North Korean human rights has urged the international community's efforts to improve rights conditions in the reclusive state. Reporting to the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva on Monday, the panel of inquiry said systematic and widespread crimes of humanity committed by the leadership in Pyongyang must no longer be neglected. Allow humanitarian assistance in accordance with humanitarian and human rights principles. Allow separated families to communicate with each other through mail and telephone and to permanently reunite. Comparing the North Korean situation to Nazi Germany, the Khmer Rouge's reign of terror in Cambodia and apartheid South Africa, Commission Chair Michael Kirby talked about taking the case to the International Criminal Court. Dismissing the panel report, the North Korean ambassador Seo Se Pyong accused the U.S. and its allies of hostile intentions behind the findings. China, the North's biggest ally, also questioned the credibility of the report, which is based on testimonies outside the regime. Pyongyang did not cooperate with the probe. Responding to Kirby's calls to stop repatriating North Korean SKPs, Beijing referred to them as illegal migrants. China's objection cast doubt over any future UN actions on the issue, since it is a veto-wielding permanent Security Council member. 
Also during Monday's session, a member of the Japanese delegation, whose daughter is presumed to have been abducted to North Korea in 1978, got a chance to speak, prompting the North Korean ambassador to walk out in protest. Choi Yusun, Arirang News. China's top nuclear negotiator has made an unexpected visit to Pyongyang in a likely effort to restart multilateral talks to denuclearize North Korea. The North state-run media on Monday said Wu Dawei, Beijing's chief envoy to the six-party talks, arrived in Pyongyang but did not give any further details. Wu's trip follows one by Vice Foreign Minister Liu Zhenmin last month when he discussed resuming the talks with North Korean officials. Seoul, Washington and Tokyo, however, refuse to return to talks just for talk's sake. They want Pyongyang to show sincerity about giving up its nuclear arms. The North wants an unconditional resumption. The six-party talks involving the two Koreas, the US, China, Japan and Russia, have been stalled since December 2008. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 50. Korea performed better than Japan on the trade front last year. The Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade said Monday that Korea logged a record high annual trade surplus of over $44 billion in 2013. Japan, on the other hand, posted a record trade deficit of over $110 billion. This despite the weakening yen. The institute says the competitiveness of major Korean exports, such as semiconductors, contributed to the record surplus despite the unfavorable exchange rate for Korea. A boycott of Japanese products in China due to a number of territorial and historical disputes also played a role. Now, Korean automakers Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors have made remarkable inroads into the global market in recent years. The country's auto parts industry is also taking really great strides on the world stage, posting ex exports well in excess of 25 billion US dollars in 2013. Song Ji Son reports. This factory produces automobile engines and transmissions 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to ensure that shipments meet order deadlines. That's because demand for its products soared 12 percent from a year earlier, largely because of orders from automakers overseas, which now represents some 40 percent of the plant's overall production. The global market recognizes the high quality of Korean-made auto parts. In our case, we do not engage in aggressive promotion, but foreign buyers directly contact us for supply contracts. This plant epitomizes a steady growth in exports of Korean auto parts, which is about double the pace of that for completely assembled cars. The recent expansion of overseas production by local automakers Hyundai and Kia helped increase auto parts exports, but GM, Ford, Volkswagen and other foreign companies accounted for well over a third of the parts exports. Korea's auto parts export logged a record 26 billion U.S. dollars last year, become the country's seventh biggest export item. The industry is gaining momentum as it diversifies its trade partners, faces tough competition as it tries to move up in the industry's pecking order. The toughest competition comes from Japan. According to a report released Monday by the Korea International Trade Association, Korea's auto parts export similarity index with Japan hit the highest at 0 0.56, meaning over half of the industry's export items are identical to those of Japan's. Many Korean auto parts have a competitive edge in pricing over those from Japan and Germany while offering just as good a quality. But market leaders in Germany and Japan keep pushing for higher standards just as Chinese makers are fast catching up. Experts say the big challenge for Korean auto parts makers is improving their research and development capabilities particularly for environmentally friendly automobiles such as electric cars. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. 
And more record exports. Korean construction companies' overseas orders are expected to reach a record 72 billion US dollars this year. Export experts say a decision by local construction companies to work together to win lucrative con contracts is a large reason behind the impressive figure. Huang Jie reports. Business is booming for Korean construction contractors in the foreign market. The nation's overseas construction orders have picked up in the first quarter of this year, taking the nation one step closer to a record high in orders. The International Contractors Association of Korea said Monday that construction contracts overseas this year have already topped 16 billion U.S. dollars. That's a nearly 70 percent spike compared to the first quarter of 2013. The association attributes the jump to a decision by local construction companies to build a consortium and win projects together. Take Teo Engineering and Construction Corporation, for example. It linked up with four other local construction companies, including GS and SK, and won three large-scale projects in Kuwait worth more than $7 billion. Industry sources say that bidding on projects along with other local construction companies has become a trend as a means to avoid cutthroat competition. And with Korea's construction companies expected to win more and more contracts from countries in the Middle East this year, the association forecasts that the nation's overseas construction orders will reach $72 billion by the time the year is up. That would surpass the previous record high of $71 billion posted in 2010. Local construction companies say they plan to employ their team strategy in other foreign markets as well, like Latin America and Africa. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea, which is the world's 12th largest economy, may have reached the limits of its ability to induce growth in the local economy by solely relying on exports. Our Kim ji explains. Booming exports were once the golden ticket for the Korean economy. But in recent years, there has been rising speculation that the country's export-driven economy may have reached the limits of its ability to induce growth. Data from the Bank of Korea shows the number of those employed has gradually reduced despite a surge in exports. For every increase in exports worth 1 billion Korean won, or $933,000 in 2011, less than six people found new jobs. That's a sharp reduction from 1995, when more than 20 people found new jobs for every increase in exports of the same amount. Many in Korea suggest rather than focusing on exports, there's a need to shift the focus to other areas to bring vitality to the local economy. They suggest lifting heavy regulations in the service sector, which has the highest number of restrictions placed on it. Related officials in the aesthetic surgery industry say excessive regulations are taking a heavy toll on Korea's competitiveness in the field of aesthetic surgery. There is a growing demand for aesthetic surgery in Korea and from abroad. But investors are getting increasingly more reluctant to invest in R&D to related technologies due to regulations on the industry. This will in the longer term would affect the country's competitiveness in the field. Experts also suggest establishing a K-zone, a free economic zone that would make it easier for Koreans and foreigners to do business. The K-zone will cover an area within a 2,000-kilometer radius or three-hour flying distance from a designated area, such as the Incheon International Airport. That would likely include some parts of China, Japan, Mongolia and Taiwan and extend to an estimated 1.5 billion people. The K-Zone is not just a tourist site, it's a business and financial hub. That would induce global companies and international organizations to put their headquarters in Korea. The expert added the government would also need to ease visa restrictions for residents living within the K-Zone so foreigners could come and go easily. Kim ji Arirang News. To, to realize its vision for a creative economy, the Korean government is putting its money where its mouth is. Roughly 56 million US dollars will be injected into what's being called a creative economy vitamin project this year. It aims at realizing sustainable growth and cultivating new business sectors by integrating information technology with existing industries. Uh, that includes agriculture, education and tourism. 
The Science and ICT Ministry says 23 assignments have been finalised. They include developing a forecasting system to better prepare for natural disasters and upgrading and networking tourist information. Now for an update on the search for Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 that disappeared 11 days ago now. We're going to turn to the new centre where our Eunice Kim is standing by. Hi Mark, yeah, Malaysian's authorities are still working with dozens of countries, 26 in all now, to find focus points in this unprecedented search that essentially covers two vast air corridors, one over Asia as far as Kazakhstan to the north and another over a lot of ocean and part of Indonesia's Sumatra Island to the south. Meanwhile, we did hear from the chief executive of Malaysia Airlines Monday that initial investigations have shown it was the co-pilot 27-year-old Farik Abdul Hamid, who had given the all right good night sign off shortly before the plane disappeared. There are still no substantial leads, though, 11 days after the Boeing 777 went missing. And as Malaysian authorities line up the data they have so far to piece together a motive, it appears the transponder, which identifies planes to controllers, was switched off at a point between two airspace sectors when Malaysia. Asian and Vietnamese controllers could assume the plane was in each other's uh, territory. Moving on to some other news, we turn to Washington now, where U.S. President Barack Obama called on Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas to take risks for peace, echoing a sentiment expressed to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu two weeks earlier. The comments come as a U.S. framework for peace talks appears to have hit a roadblock over the issue of Palestine's recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Netanyahu has required it. Abbas has refused. Fused it. During Monday's talks in the Oval Office, Abbas indirectly addressed this sticking point, noting through a translator that Palestinians recognized the state of Israel in 1993. He also said Israel needs to release a fourth batch of Palestinian prisoners by March 29th under a previous agreement to show its commitment to achieve peace. The U.S. framework for peace faces an April deadline and with little tangible progress. It is up for an extension. U.S. automaker General Motors has announced another massive recall, this time calling back one and a half million vehicles linked to three new safety problems. The latest recall comes out of an internal probe triggered by its first recall last month of 1.6 million older model cars linked to ignition problems that led to dozens of deadly crashes dating back a decade. For its slow reaction to the ignition defect, the leading American American car company is under investigation by U.S. authorities. And in a rare video admission posted online, GM chief executive Mary Barra said, quote, terrible things happened when something went wrong with our process. She said the company is conducting an intense review of its internal processes and will change how it handles recalls in the future. And staying in the U.S., scientists at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics say they have found, quote, echoes of the Big Bang 14 billion years ago. The detection of these gravitational waves was discovered at the South Pole with a telescope, they said, confirming a crucial connection between quantum mechanics and general relativity. The experts called the discovery one of the most important goals in cosmology today. The gravitational waves were spotted by targeting the telescope to a specific area of the sky outside the galaxy known as the Southern Hole, where small fluctuations gave researchers new clues about conditions in the early universe. And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off with some awards to be given out to some of the best athletes here in the nation. And best might be an understatement for some. 
Three South Korean athletes, figure skater Kim Myona, speed skater Lee Sung Hwa, and short track skater Park Seung Hee, will be receiving the Order of Sports Merit's Blue Dragon Award, the highest award given to an athlete here in the nation. While the award is given on a point system, Kim Myona was just short of the 1500 point requirement, but the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism decided to give her the honors due to the controversial finish in Sochi. And moving over to short track, where after An Hyun Soo, aka Victor Ahn, claimed three gold medals in Sochi, President Park Geun-hye made sure there was going to be an investigation to why Ahn left Korea and joined Russia. And when the president gets involved, things are going to get serious. And on Monday, amid all the controversies involved with the South Korean short track team, the vice chief of the Korea Skating Union, Chung Myung-gyu, resigned from his post. Experts say that this comes after the poor showing by the men's short track team in Sochi and the previous incident which caused Victor Ahn to leave to Russia. Now, Chun was a former short track skater before coaching for 15 years. And now shifting over to the V-League, where the 2014 V-League Playoff Media Day took place on Monday, which six teams from the women's and men's team got together for a press conference. Of course, over on the women's side, with IBK Altos, Tejon KGC, and GS Kartex heading over to the playoffs, the Altos will be waiting for the other teams in the finals. And with the Altos coming off of a championship win last season, many believe them to be the favorites this year as well, with Karina Cassio leading the way. Meanwhile, over on the men's side, the Samsung Hwaja Blue Fangs look to claim their seventh straight championship. As many countries agreed, Leo Martinez is unstoppable as the Hyundai Capital Skywalkers and the Korean Air Jumbo square off in the playoffs. And speaking of playoffs, let's shift over to Game 3 of the KBL's first round series between the Seoul SK Knights and the Koyang Orions. And going into the highlight tier first quarter of the game, the Orions looking sharp on the field, taking a 19-10 lead before heading into the halftime with a comfortable 41-28 lead. Second half, the Orions continue to dominate the SK Knights on the paint as Leon Mart Williams leads the way with 17 points and 12 rebounds as the Orions force the series to game four with the 81-64 win. And staying in basketball, but over in the United States, where the NCAA March Madness is set to begin, with the brackets all set for the 64 schools competing for the national championship. Now, four schools taking the number one seed are University of Florida, University of Arizona, University of Virginia, and the undefeated Wichita State. But of course, as all fans know, the March Madness is all about upsets, as the round of 64 is set to begin from March 20th to March 21st, with the national championship scheduled for April 7th. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Well, wake-up temperatures for this morning was on the mild side, near or above 10 degrees Celsius. But the rain from yesterday dragged temperatures down by a few notches across the nation. So it will be slightly cooler today, but still above the seasonal averages. So we can expect to have a spring weather today. And we can also expect to have sunnier day. Uh, so I wish I could tell you to make the best of today's warmth. But it seems like we have unwelcome visitor. It's yellow dust from China. Low levels of yellow dust will hit across the peninsula this afternoon and might linger till tomorrow. And as for the weather outlook towards the end of the week, readings will gradually drop each day. So uh, we can expect to have breezy and sunny spring weather ahead of us. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The afternoon highs in Seoul will rise to 14 degrees Celsius, which is a 
about 4 to 5 degrees lower than yesterday, while Daegu and Gwangju should peak to 22 and 18 respectively, and Busan will get up to 19 later in the day. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like down on Jeju will climb up to 18 and Daejeon will top out at 17, while the top temperature of Mount Kungang will be at 6 this afternoon. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world. And that's all for now. We'll be back at noon Korea time. In the meantime, you can always catch up what's been happening on our New Look website, which can be found at arirang.co.kr forward slash news.